Uh, so, so welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed yourself thus far. Um, uh, this afternoon session is opened by um, a man that needs, who needs no introduction, um, but just as a reminder, I'll say that. That 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 professor um, uh, Talis is um, uh, a physician. Uh, by, by trait, but a philosopher and a humanist by calling. Um, he, has, he has written uh, over 200 articles for the foremost uh, medical journals, um, and he's also widely published in philosophy, um, including a recent uh, a book, Aping Mankind, uh, Neuromedia Darwinitis and the Misinterpretation of Humanity, which uh, uh, bears somewhat upon um, what we're going to hear today. So please give a warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Mikolai. And Dobre uh, Vietje to the people in uh, Warsaw who are listening to this lecture, I believe. So uh, thank you. I do feel as I've come somewhat naked into the conference chamber, which is probably the right dress code in view of the temperature. Uh, but I've missed all of this morning's uh, talks for reasons I'm afraid I, uh, that were beyond my control. So I suspect already a lot of the things I'm about to say have already been totally deconstructed, uh, in particular regarding the nature of, of, of personhood and so on. So who knows what's going to happen to me in the next, you know, whatever. But onward and upward. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for, for having me. Can neuroscience cast light on personhood? Now, in order to answer this question, it's necessary, of course, to clarify some terms. First, neuroscience. By this I mean the study of the way the brain is put together its connections with and influence on the rest of the body, and more particularly the activity of the brain at rest and in response to events, ranging from simple sensory stimuli to complex situations, evoking complex responses, when the owner of the brain is or is not engaged in some activity or other, studying it in sickness and in health, damaged or undamaged. And by neuroscience, I will mean not only what is currently on offer, <coughs> impressive though it is, but what it may discover using more refined tools and experimental designs. Secondly, personhood, and this is where I know I'm going to run into trouble, or the condition of being a person. Being a person, of course, has many elements, as the word has many different meanings. I struggle with these in a book I published a decade ago, and the memory of my failure is not pleasant. I concluded that, to misquote Kant, out of the crooked timber of human discourse, no straight thing was ever made. <laughs> I refer to this book mainly out of vanity because I would love its sales to go into double figures, but that's life. <laughs> Here are some of the characteristics associated with the idea of personhood or being a person. And I rem I, uh, it's intended to remind this audience that requires no reminder that it is a difficult term, as becomes evident when we try and clarify for the purpose of philosophical discussion. A person is a being who can say I and mean it, or a self-conscious being whose consciousness is unified at a particular time and over time, or a subject, and the term subject ranges from the crash dieted version of a logical subject, implicit in experiences, memories, emotions, etc., through a slightly fatter embodied subject, capable of, for example, occupying the centre of egocentric space and being a point of apparent origin of actions, <coughs> to the considerably fatter bearer of an owned life, or to a legal entity to which rights and responsibilities may be attached. I offer this list incomplete because it doesn't encompass the entire scopes of selves, egos, and other first-person entities for two reasons. The first is to underline something that I'm pretty confident would have been talked about today, that the notion of personhood is irremediably baggy and cannot be reduced to a, set of, a small set of essential characteristics. And secondly, to give an idea of the kinds of things that neuroscience would have to cast light on if it were to cast light on personhood. I want to simplify my task by boiling the question down to can, or boiling the question, can neuroscience cast light on personhood down to a simple one? To what extent are persons identical with their brains? If brains and persons were 100% the same, as many have claimed, then brain science would be personal <coughs> science. The royal road to understanding what people are would be to peer inside their skulls using techniques such as functional magnetic re resonance imaging which observe brain activity in the living, waking person. Now, in this inevitably superficial talk, I want to set out some of the reasons why it is wrong to regard people as being identical with their brains, and in mistake to talk about brains when we should be talking about people. 
I'm going to deal with nothing thoroughly, but I hope by the time, the hope that by passing over some issues and leaving a reasonable amount of time for discussion, this slot will be more interesting than if I talked for my full hour. First, I'm going to list some of the ways in which persons of what we might call a neurophilic persuasion identify people with their brains. Then I'm going to suggest why so many people are inclined to make this identification. Indeed, see it as plain common sense, validated by neuroscience. After these preliminaries, I will set out the reasons for denying that persons are brains or their brains. And this is going to occupy most of my talk. Finally, I'm going to say something about the challenges that have to be met if we establish if we establish that brains and persons are not identical. Where do we go from here? Now, there are many ways of identifying brains with persons, such that person identity is brain identity and person history is brain history. And here are some of the ways. Persons are all of their brains. Excuse me, sorry about that. Persons are all of their brains. Persons are parts of their brains. Persons are software implemented in the hardware of the brain. And persons are connectomes, how their brains are wired up. <coughs> But this does leave, leave a significant residual ambiguity between what we might call the functional structure of the brain and the neural activity taking place in that functional structure. This is mirrored, however, in a further ambiguity in the idea of a person, as on the one hand a set of standing propensities to feel or to act, and on the other the sum total of their action, actual feelings and actions. But things are already complicated enough, so I want to set that aside for the present. Now, I wouldn't be at all unhappy if it came up in question time. Now, the notion that the person is identical with all the brain was proposed by Hippocrates two and a half thousand years ago. As he said in his treatise on epilepsy, men ought to know that from the brain, and from the brain only, arise our pleasures, joys, laughter and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, grief and tears. Through it, in particular, we think, see, hear, and distinguish the ugly from the beautiful, the bad from the good, the pleasant from the unpleasant. Chairman, may I t have permission to take off my jacket? No, thank you. Thank you. Now, this sounds remarkably similar to Francis Crick a couple of decades ago. Your joys and sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. And one of the, I think, myths around the idea that you are your brain is that it's a new idea and it's the result of uh, discoveries in neuroscience. And a lot of people who put this forward are quite unaware that the idea is at least two and a half thousand years old. It probably goes back to the pre-Socratics, who were people in this audience who know this better than myself. But Crick, in common with, any other, uh, with many others, thought that the self was located in part of the brain, not in the whole of it. His favourite spot was the claustrum, deep in the hemispheres, where many pathways converged, a choice that illustrates fallacy that I want to look at in due course. Now, these are uh, some of the ways in which personhood is construed as being identical with activity in the brain. But why do we even think that we might find personhood in, or in the brain? There are reasons rooted in everyday observation and reasons that seem to take their rise from neuroscience. Firstly, some very basic, naive, homely observations that seem to form the basis for thinking that personhood is inseparable from the brain, and the fate of the person is inextricably bound up with the fate of the brain. Most obviously, the hair of the eye is located, in a sort of sense, where the brain is. The brain, or the head that contains it, may be seen to define the centre of egocentric space. Insofar as that space has coordinates, I am their point of origin, and that is where my brain is, and not, for example, where my leg is. I could have left my leg in Manchester, and as long as I hadn't bled to death on the way down here, uh, I could still be here, but I couldn't do the same with my brain. If my brain is in a particular room in Oxford, so am I. The, leaving aside the problem that my brain is not in the room in the way that I am in the room, just as my brain is inside my skull in the way that I'm not inside my skull, leaving aside the problem, this problem, it does seem intuitively very attractive to identify my location with that of the brain. Of course, the room that houses the brain is a material location, whereas the room that I am in now is a network of significations that includes the reasons for my being in this room. Be that as it may, it's evident that my history and the spatio-temporal trajectory of my brain are inseparable. There is an overlap between where I have been and where my brain has been. 
This is the most powerful, if slightly naive, basis for the belief that I am my brain. But secondly, there are the effects of brain damage. Severe brain damage may lead to loss of consciousness and loss of personhood. Less severe brain damage causes impairment or alteration of consciousness and change in personality. And these homely observations <coughs> have been supplemented by a huge body of knowledge about the impact of injury to or dysfunction of different parts of the brain on every aspect of behaviour and awareness. Recordings made from the brains of living subjects using technologies such as electroencephalography and various kinds of brain scan, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, have demonstrated striking correlations of neural activity with levels of consciousness. Alert, drowsy, asleep, comatose, probably your history as, I'm, as you're listening to my talk, the history uh, that uh, you will enact as I proceed. There are strong correlations of these levels of consciousness with appearances of EEGs and other, um, other activity on the brain. Correlations also with the contents of consciousness, perception, memory, emotion and thought. Less closely, but still impressively to some, with the propensity to behave in a certain way. Although I would draw your attention to two very savage assaults on social neuroscience, uh, the kind of neuroscience that claims to be able to correlate, for example, the feeling of love with activity in a certain part of the brain. Ed Vols in 2009 published a paper called Voodoo Correlations in Social Neuroscience, and more strikingly is, is a paper published uh, a couple of months ago by uh, Catherine Button and others in Nature Neuroscience Reviews, one of the top journals, which showed how the statistics in an awful lot of this kind of neuroscience is full of very elementary errors. So the correlations aren't quite as good as has been claimed. Anyway, it seems reasonable to many to conclude from this that every aspect of the consciousness of a person, from the most primitive sensation to the most exquisitely constructed sense of self, depends in some sense, or is in some way caught up with, brain activity, and the location, pattern and distribution of brain activity is predictably associated with experiences, moods and so on. And from this, it's but a step to say that personhood is brainhood. You are your brain. And we are justified in concluding from this that to live a normal life as a person requires a brain <coughs> in good working order. But are we justified in concluding from this that to live a normal life as a person is to be a brain in some kind of working order? And are we further justified in concluding that brain is not only necessary but also a sufficient condition of personhood? Indeed, the persons and brains are the same. In order to answer this question, I'm going to look at certain aspects of personhood, many steps below those which perhaps we might discuss when we're thinking about full-blown personhood, such as I referred to earlier, and see whether these aspects could be identical with what goes on in the brain. If neuroscience cannot accommodate these fairly basic or ground floor aspects of personhood, then it seems unlikely to cast much light on what it is to be a person. And the aspects I want to look at are consciousness, and Peter here tried to persuade me uh, over a, a year ago, over a long dinner, to try and use the word consciousness properly, and he will see how little uh, he, he, he <laughs> has cured me of my in, in proper use. And I just suspect, can, can I book you for a second dinner, Peter? <laughs> But I want to look at consciousness, which I would say is a sine qua non condition of personhood, as that in virtue of which there are phenomenal appearances, um, and which, from perception upwards, has intentionality. First person being that underpins having or being a viewpoint. The unity of consciousness at any particular time, the basis of having a unity of consciousness over time, one of the fundamental characteristics of being a person, and the temporal depth of consciousness the sense of I extended over time. A fifth aspect of personhood, of course, is agency. And I'm going to set that aside. Suffice to say that the claim that neuroscience has shown that we are not free because freedom cannot be understood in neuroscientific terms depends on the claim that neuroscience is the last word on what is there and on what we are. And this, of course, is what I propose to challenge. First of all, consciousness. Is brain activity sufficient for consciousness so we can identify the one with the other? Now, before I deal with the arguments, some, most of which will be very familiar to you, but I think are worth rehearsing, before I deal with the arguments, let me set aside an empirical red herring. 
it is possible by direct brain stimulation to cause individuals to have quite complex experiences. The most famous example is the work of the neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield, who stimulated the cerebral cortex of waking subjects prior to deciding where it would be safe to remove bits of the brain to treat otherwise intractable epilepsy. When certain areas were stimulated, there would not only be simple sensations, but often quite complex experiences corresponding to previously dormant memories of past events. Now, this has seemed to suggest to some that experiences could be generated in the standalone brain, and that, as suggested in the Brain in the Vat thought experiment, the entire consciousness of a person could be created or constructed by stimulation of the neural inputs of a brain sustained in a bath of nutrient. This conclusion is invalid. First, Penfield subjects were already awake. In other words, the background wakefulness required for the experiences to be had and interpreted was provided independently of the stimulation. Secondly, the experiences would not have counted as memories of the subject's own past, except in relation to a life prior to the moment of stimulation in which experiences have been had in the usual way and then subsequently qualified as memories. In other words, these experiences generated in a standalone brain are parasitic on experiences had in the usual way. So much for the red herring, now to the arguments. Now before I consider whether these features of personhood could be plausibly located in the brain, I want to rephrase the question. The brain, I think most of us would agree, is a piece of matter. So the question is, could a piece of matter have the consciousness that is necessary to be a person? If not, the brain could not be a person. And by a piece of matter, I mean a piece of something whose definitive description or most authoritative portrait is to be found in the physical sciences. This has been part of the neuroscientist's creed for a long time, as witnessed this quote from the leading 19th century biologist and one of the founders of neurophysiology, Dubois Huemon. Brooker, and that was one of his colleagues, Brooker and I pledged a solemn oath to put into power this truth. No other forces than the common physical chemical ones are active within the organism. More recently, this has been spelled out in Elvestroff large print by Daniel Dunnett. There was a little bit of hedging about whether physics, rather than, say, biology, is the last word. There is only one sort of stuff, namely matter, the physical stuff of physics, chemistry, and physiology. And the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. In short, the mind is the brain. And this is the key bit. We can, in principle, account for every mental phenomenon using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, continental drift, photosynthesis, reproduction, nutrition, growth, and general net. Okay. <laughs> well, this should block off mobilizing certain terms of rhetoric that are often put into play when materialists are challenged to explain the difference between unconscious matter and conscious people. Terms such as emergence, supervenience, and complexity. Since the net says that the same physical principles are conserved when we move from rocks, and I say the same principles, when we move from rocks to bacteria to professors of philosophy. And I'm going to touch on these terms, supervenience and so on, at the, briefly at the end of my talk. But to consciousness. Now the case for the identity of phenomenal consciousness and neural activity does seem to be based on a bit of a sliver. The sliver is from rough correlation of activity in certain parts of the brain with conscious experiences, and the, with, with un unconscious experiences slithering from that <coughs> to the belief that the brain activity causes or generates consciousness, and thence to the further belief that brain activity is consciousness. Now this slither, of course, has been challenged for, for a long time, Victorian times onwards, beautifully expressed here by Alfred Wallace. The passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. Were our minds and senses so expanded, strengthened and illuminated as to enable us to see and feel the very molecules of the brain? Were we capable of following all their motions we should be as far as ever from the solution of the problem, how are these physical processes connected with facts of consciousness? The chasm between the two classes of phenomena would still remain intellectually impassable. Now the reply of the neurophilosophers has usually been, it's a brute fact, get over it. So the question we need to ask is, can you be a sincere or consistent materialist and believe that conscious persons are brain activity? So you could build a person out of neural activity using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, content, grip, etc. etc. Now, if we, if we conclude that we cannot do so in principle, then we need to abandon the person-brain identity theory. Now, in addressing this, I'm going over some extremely well-trodden well territory. 
in full awareness of J.L. Austin's observation that one has to be a special kind of fool to rush in where so many angels have trodden already. But I want to take a slightly different path through this well-trodden territory. As I focus on intentionality, of course, a familiar concept, and on phenomenal appearances. But let me touch on intentionality first, taking a very simple example. Now, at this stage, I may imagine there may be a collective intake of breath at the naive way in which I present the notion of intentionality. But I still think there is some truth in our naive, naive understanding of intentionality. I want to focus on the perception of material object, such as this person looking at a glass. We have here the case of an embodied subject looking at an object that she appreciates as being other than herself. Now, the laws of nature, as evident in the material world, would seem to be in, or in ordinary operation as we follow the causal chain that links the events in the glass, indicated by the upper arrow, with the events in the retina, the visual pathways terminating in the cerebral cortex. The causal sequence marked by the upper arrow passes through the brain and may indeed have a behavioural output. But of course, this causal sequence doesn't seem to be quite identical with awareness of the glass out there as something other than me. That is indicated by the lower arrow, which of course is not reverse causation or contracausal or feedback or reaching for the glass, but it is certainly not gathered up in the notion of causation, which explains uh, what's happening on the upper arrow. The causal chain, the processes and laws by which the light gets into and passes down <coughs> the visual pathways do not encompass the gaze looking out. And there is something going on here that is at odds with the laws of material nature as they, as they apply to the things that Danette listed. And this is a point that has made, been made repeatedly, but it seems to be, it doesn't seem to make a, a, any impact. In fact, Herbert Fiegel, uh, in a, uh, using a phrase 50 years ago, described, if you like, the lower arrow as a nom nomological dangler, which, as he argued, would have no place in the world picture of physical science. Now, we can highlight this oddness in different ways. Firstly, intentionality reaches, as it were, causally upstream. If the perception of the glass were identical with activity in the visual cortex, that activity here would be mysteriously reaching back to its own causal antecedents. Interestingly, reaching past some antecedents, for example, activity in the retina, and stopping <laughs> short of other antecedents, everything from the Big Bang onwards that led up to the light, interacting at that moment with the glass. Secondly, the objects of our human perception exceed that which is revealed to our senses. Perception goes beyond sentience. Object perception <coughs> is the most basic example of the fact that, as Barry Stroud has said, our objects of knowledge are underdetermined by whatever it is that we get through the source of knowledge known as the senses or experience. This is the level at which experience has reference beyond itself. In summary, the law governed causal pathways seen in the material world don't seem to capture what happens when a person is engaged in something as simple as being aware of a glass. Never mind when that person is aware of another person being aware of her or aware of the social pressure to conform to an abstract principle. Now this has motivated, I'm sure many of you are aware, <coughs> some pretty desperate situa suggestions, particularly to get rid of intentionality, which John Searle does describe as having had a toxic history and the connected notion that consciousness is about an object distinct from itself. These include the assertion that consciousness, or in some case, in the case of the mind, is the brain's experience of itself, or that consciousness is our perception of some physical process in the brain. In short, that consciousness and the appearance of that which seems to appear to us are made of the appearance of nerve impulses to themselves. This notion of the manifest world is an idea cooked up by neurons fusing that which is to be perceived and that in virtue of which it is perceived <coughs> of neural activity mysteriously aware of itself and transforming that awareness into awareness of a world that causes it and is separate from itself is possibly the unhappiest marriage of materialism and idealism one can imagine. This is recognised by one or two writers for example the philosopher of biology Alex Rosenberg in his latest book he says mind is identical with the brain a thought must be an event in the brain. No neural activity can be about anything inside or outside our mind. No thought, therefore, is about anything. <laughs> what can one say but speak to yourself, mate? <laughs> now, some of you may have winced at my diagram with the two arrows. 
Perception is not at all like this, with the light getting in and the gaze reaching out. As, as an author, as I was, of a monograph on Heidegger's being in time, and as someone who's been acutely aware, at least of some of Wittgenstein's aspersions on these kinds of ideas of consciousness, I wince in time with you. But this is the kind of absurdity you're left with if you identify consciousness with neural activity provoked by the things that consciousness is conscious of. Let me change tack, therefore, and examine something even more basic and universal, consciousness as phenomenal appearances. Conscious beings such as persons are those are entities in virtue of which items such as material objects, as well as many other things, have appearances to a viewpoint. Do material objects in themselves have appearances? Are they items which either correspond to or form the basic contents of consciousness? Now we can approach this in a couple of ways. The first is to note that the concept of matter, or the basic stuff of the world as seen through the eyes of physics, is actually alien to appearances. The second is that the notion of material objects having an appearance in themselves, independent of any viewpoint, is self-contradictory. I'll come to that in a second. But let me focus on the idea that material objects have appearances in themselves. We can see this indirectly when we notice how as the descriptions of the world approach an account that sees that world as simply configurations of matter, there is a progressive disappearance of appearance. Ultimately, the matter becomes a purely quantitative rather than a qualitative concept. Consider an object such as a table. As I experience it, it may seem large or small, light brown or dark brown, heavy or light. As seen through the lens of physical science, even if we don't drill down to the atomic level, the tail table, for it starts to boil down to certain quantities. It is two foot by two foot. It has such and such a weight. The light reflected from it has a certain mixture of quantitative wavelengths. This approach to the table, which bypasses those things that are peculiar to my view or yours, as it becomes progressively more objective and a more appropriate substrate for a law-based understanding, gradually eludes phenomenal appearances, those things that constitute the world of which we are conscious. The phenomenal appearances inescapably become dismissed as being ontologically shabby, as mere secondary qualities. The warmth of heat, the opposition of inertia, the brightness of light, all vanish. In short, there is a progressive disappearance of phenomenal appearance, of that which fills, or take your pick, constitutes basic consciousness. In short, the world, according to physics, and the kind of laws that treat earthquakes and photosynthesis equally, and should treat neural activity likewise, is a world in which appearance is being made willfully to disappear. And this is something that philosophers, scientists, and philosophers of science have been aware of since Galileo first made the distinction between primary qualities, which are essentially quantities, and secondary qualities, and exclude the latter from the real and primary realm. A qualitative appearance cannot be equated to a set of events that are ultimately described quantitatively. But this is what neurophilosophers neuro such as Paul Churchland talk themselves into believing, as when he asserts that conscious experiences are the values of n variables in an n-dimensional activation vector space. Another way of looking at this is to see that physical science has as its asymptote the most general laws that represent the sum total of things, and hence things viewed from no particular perspective. The equations linking patterns of measured change are delocalized. They offer not so much a Nagelian view from nowhere as a view without a viewpoint, which is perhaps the same thing. This is another aspect of the fact that the laws of physics are laws of a world in which appearance has disappeared, even though it may be indirectly represented as the product of measurement and a predictor of measurement. Now, you might think the arguments I've just been offering you over the last few minutes are based on an elementary confusion between how things are represented and what they are. But this distinction doesn't alter the fact that the abolition of viewpoint that generates the notion of matter as something in itself, independent of consciousness, removes appearances. And this, by the way, is how a rock or a mountain or the world would appear from their viewpoint. An item such as a rock cannot have an appearance that is neither from the front, from the back, or from above, or from below, or from within or without, from near or far, in good light or poor light. So a sincere materialist cannot look to material objects such as the brain to be the basis of phenomenal consciousness. Things are no better if we focus on neural activity, which are, after all, biophysical events in material objects. They don't have an appearance in themselves, and there is nothing within them to make other items appear, for them to be that in, in virtue of which appearance is possible. And this is connected 
with one of the many intractable problems facing those who wish to neuralize consciousness. Very little of the activity in the central nervous system is associated with consciousness. From this we can infer that there is nothing in nerve impulses per se that would make, themselves, make them conscious of themselves or of a world. So, of course, the hunt is on to identify those additional characteristics that neural activity must have in order to transform it from the background to or a condition of consciousness into consciousness itself. Location in a particular part of the brain or in several parts of the brain linked together in an ensemble, the assumption of a certain pattern of activity and or rising above a threshold, none of these offer any plausible explanation of how biophysical events should take on an entirely different character. We know that travel broadens the mind, but it's not clear why travel to a particular place in a brain would broaden neural activity into a mind. And it's unclear whether consciousness reposes in the travelling or in the arrival or in the excitation of the circuit, which can seem, be seen from the outside to combine the two. The failure to find clear or plausible criteria for distinguishing the tiny minority of nerve impulses <coughs> supposedly associated with consciousness from the mass, vast majority that aren't is set out very clearly in the gruelling 40-page discussion in David Chalmers' The Character of Consciousness. What little plausibility candidates for the criteria for neural activity that will become conscious, become consciousness, have, have is often borrowed from an outside conscious viewpoint. An intensity, a pattern, an ensemble or a circuit count as one able to top themselves up to a conscious entity only from an external viewpoint that will do the totting up. They don't top themselves up. But borrowing such a viewpoint is not legitimate because there are no such viewpoints in a purely material world. And this is connected with an earlier point. Since the universe, described by the laws of physics, has no viewpoint, and persons inescapably have viewpoints, the former cannot capture the latter. It's, this, it's at this point that the difference between animal sentience and human consciousness, implicit in the full-blown intentionality of perception, seen in humans becomes explicit. The existential reality of personhood, the pers perspectival interest-rooted viewpoint of the person, has even less place in the material world than does phenomenal appearance. No piece of matter would or could be the centre of egocentric space. The brain qua matter could not insert a centre into an intrinsically centreless and peripheryless, peripheryless material world. There's no near or far, inside or outside, mine or not mine, no here or there, as layers, elaborations, or tenses of egocentric space. And, as we shall discuss, there's no now either. There is, what is more, nothing to provide the basis for the situation where I am my brain, because first-person being, with the I and the possessive and the am as opposed to is, is could not get a foothold in a universe that is not even third-person. This is, of course, connected with the unavailability of intentionality in the material world. The first-person is the subjectively experienced centre of a world, opened up in an acentric material universe. Human perception, which locates items out there with respect to me here, locates me at the centre of things because the lines of intentionality have a genuine origin or a vanishing point at a me located in my body. As a first person being, I face or confront a world rather than merely being coarsely wired into it like a stone or a bacterium or any unconscious bit of living matter. First person being poses another problem for the neural eyes of consciousness. Even if we shrivel the person in question to mere self moments, it's this. The many experiences that we have at one time, sights, sounds, smells and other sensations, as well as memories, thoughts and emotions, are in some sense unified, having a subject unity, where they are experienced as belonging to the self at the same time. They belong to a sense of me here now, to what we might call co-consciousness. The different contents of consciousness are supposed to be kept apart by existing in different parts of the brain. Yet they're also required to come together. And however this convergence is accomplished, say by merging the pathways between the different parts of the brain, those contents would always seem, in the very act of becoming unified, to lose their distinction, being boiled down to some unholy soup of undifferentiated awareness. One of the most striking mysteries of the field of consciousness, of the momentary self, is that it is unified while still retaining the distinctiveness of its, con of its contents. This is the so-called binding problem, and there have been many attempts to find a solution to it. 
These attempts mostly depend on the idea that certain physical properties common to large swathes of the brain can, as it were, bring together activities scattered across different regions. All of the different regions will be activated at once, we are told in a moment of consciousness, but without losing their spatial separateness. And proposed candidates for the special properties have included electromagnetic fields, quantum coherence, and synchronous electric, electrical oscillations in large sections of the cerebral cortex. But all of these candidates fail for the simple reason that they rely on objective or externally imp- on an objective or externally observed unity being translated into subject, subjective or immediately experienced unity with no reason offered for why this should happen. If we accept that physical unity per se is sufficient to create experiential unity, then the anatomical unity of the brain, or indeed the body, should be considered of equal power to explain the unity of consciousness. What is more, of course, this assumption would result in conflicting unifications with a loss of distinction between the components of consciousness. The appeal to synchronous activity in the brain to explain how the moment of consciousness is unified is particularly revealing because it illustrates how insincere materialism is. Insincere materialists ascribe to matter properties that are borrowed from mind. The assumption that neural activity can be in- intrinsically s- synchronous locates simultaneity in the material world, something that physicists post-Einstein do not allow. Simultaneity is observer-dependent, and we pres- presuppose the existence of an observer, since the latter requires the unity of consciousness that we've been talking about. And this insincerity is also evident in the attempts to make neural sense of the temporal depth of a person, of the fact that we are aware of things that are explicitly past and anticipate things that are explicitly future or past. Let's just focus on the past. The standard story of memory is that it is, to use Henri Bergson's sardonic phrase, a cerebral deposit. It's most commonly understood as the effects that past events have had on the excitability of parts of the brain, mediated by, for example, changes in synapses. A memory is a reactivated circuit that is prone to be reactivated because it has been excited in the past. Why is this standard story nonsense? There are numerous reasons, but here are a couple. The first is this account requires the present state of the brain to reach up to the causes of its present state and to locate those causes at a temporal distance from the present. Explicit, episodic memories are explicitly of something not present, something explicitly past. So memory requires a double intentionality, two layers of aboutness. A memory is about an experience that itself was about that which it was an experience of. As discussed before, intentionality is not a property of the material world. And this applies even more clearly to double intentionality. But more importantly, perhaps, tensed time, the past, the present, the future, do not exist, so we're told, in the macroscopic material world as seen by physicists. And for this, I have no lesser authority than her, Professor Einstein himself, who said that physicists know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. And this is in a famous, though to me rather tactless letter to the recently widowed wife of his oldest friend. But there are no tenses without a conscious viewpoint to establish now. There are other characteristics of the person that cannot be captured by an account that sees the person as the property of material object even a material object as upmarket as the brain. I've mentioned ownership. Our experiences are our experiences in a rather complex sense of possession that needs much careful teasing out. And we talk about our brains. The brain is no one's brain. And then there's agency, which of course I haven't got time to discuss, except to reiterate the observation that the empirical data of neuroscience do not demonstrate that we are neurally determined in our behaviour. If I want to move on to the question of why if brainhood and personhood are so obviously distinct, the notion that we are our brains should have commanded so much attention. And there are four reasons or strategies mobilised in persuading us that the obviously untrue is true. Sorry about this. Hang on a second. Close your eyes. <laughs> Sorry. I think I've got to spoil the surprise now, but there you go. These are the strategies... Thinking by transferred epithets that results in personifying the brain in order to brainify the person. (laughs) Then ascribing to brains or parts of brains attributes appropriately ascribed to persons and much fancy footwork between brains, machines and and, and, and unconscious minds. Denying the reality, hopeful hand-waving, denying the reality of what neuroscience cannot see 
and arguing that there is no alternative. So first, thinking by transferred epithets, personifying the brain in order to brainify the person. This includes, as I said, ascribing to brains or parts of brains attributes appropriately ascribed to persons and much fancy footwork between brains, machines and conscious minds. And I'm going to say very little about this because, of course, it has been dealt with brilliantly and definitively by Peter in his writing. But what about hand-waving terms, which promise so much when they're not examined closely, and even less when they are, but rather less when we ask for clarity? Terence Deakin's recent 500-age book on how mind emerged from matter via living matter and other thermodynamic systems, which I had the alloyed pleasure of reviewing, is a perfect example of this. Yes, squids have different properties than crystals, but this doesn't demonstrate that the difference between unconscious crystals and, say, conscious human beings can be explained by emergence on the basis of increased complexity. Any appeal to complexity, and it's a frequent appeal, should be challenged on two fronts. What is meant by complexity? How is it to be measured or diagnosed? And why should it deliver the difference between, say, a bacterium innocent of its own existence and a person with all the characteristics we've been talking about? The usual response to this challenge is ever more frantic, hand-waving. Supervenience is a term that amuses me. It is usually invoked as a corrective to the self-inflicted wound of an infravenient description of something. But in all three cases, complexity, supervenience, emergence, there is an endeavour to get something different and yet to stay with the same. In no cases have I come across has the next promise to stick with the same physical principles, laws and raw materials actually being kept. Another strategy, of course, is to deny the existence. Sorry about this. Is to deny the existence of those things that cannot be accommodated in neuroscience. The self, the ego, and agency are frequently dismissed as ontologically suspect. And bolder or more desperate spirits have even dismissed qualia. Never mind propositional attitudes such as beliefs, as relics of pre-scientific psychology. <coughs> A not infrequent claim is that agency and the I and the self are illusions cooked up in the brain. But this opens up some interesting questions. Why should a piece of matter, a mere byway in the causal net, come to the false conclusion that it is somewhat superior to other pieces of matter? And by what material means would another piece of matter make the mistake of becoming aware that it is what it is? Well, it's time for me to draw to a close. And I'm conscious very much that I've touched on many things very superficially. In particular, I've glided over or passed the different challenges presented to us by the sentience found widely in the animal kingdom and human consciousness and personhood. Additionally, it would be interesting, I would interest to know, whether tensionality can carry the weight that I, along, of course, with many others, have placed on it. Does it resist biologization, as I believe, or is it, after all, a biological property, as many, such as John Searle, have asserted? I have focused on the troubles of neurophilosophy, but I'm aware that anti-neurophilosophy is not without its troubles. Those who believe that personhood boils down to brainhood are entitled to point to several serious questions that opponents like me leave unanswered. Why, if the brain is not the basic consciousness, is it so intimately bound up with our awareness and our behaviour? What are we to make of the genuine advances of neuroscience? Should we abandon brain science entirely as a source of understanding of personhood? Where would the brain fit into a metaphysics, an epistemology, an ontology that denies the place, that denies the brain a place at their centre? How should we deal with the fact that we are evolved organisms as well as persons? Well, these are some of the questions that I think anti neurophilosophers like me should be obliged to address. In the meantime, I hope I've persuaded anybody in the audience who needs to be persuaded that neuroscience, far from being the last word on personhood, casts very little light on it. Thank you.